Stranger Things. The kids, the superpowers, the soundtrack, the hair, what's not to love? And season three looks like it's gonna be just as binge-worthy as the last two, but there is a downside to that binging. It can make it hard to keep track of everything that's happened. Cramming isn't healthy, folks. That's why we've put together this handy timeline that's sure to be a little less confusing than Mr. Clark's explanation of interdimensional travel. Get out your hairspray and let's dive in. 1953 to 1982. Welcome to Hawkins. In 1953, MK Ultra, the real, actual CIA program to study mind control, begins and operates operations kick off at Hawkins National Lab. Eventually, Terry Ives signs up for MK Ultra under the supervision of Dr. Brenner. Once she becomes pregnant, Brenner starts planning to keep the unborn child as a test subject. When Terry gives birth to her daughter Jane in 1971, Brenner kidnaps the baby, brings her back to the lab, and gives her a new name. Eleven. Three years later, Terry breaks into Hawkins' lab to take Jane back, but just as she finds Jane and Kali in the Rainbow Room, Terry is caught and forced to undergo electroconvulsive therapy. The scientists leave her in a catatonic state and then release her to her sister Becky. From here, Becky becomes her caretaker. At some point over the next few years, Kali escapes from Hawkins' lab and begins taking revenge on those who worked there. A little later, 1979 is a bad year for Jim Hopper. His daughter Sarah passes away from what's probably cancer, he and his wife Diane split, and he moves back to Hawkins from the big city to work as the chief of police. Fans speculate that the big city is New York, based on boxes you can see in his grandfather's cabin in season two. Jeez, talk about a downgrade. Have you ever tried to get a bagel in Indiana? No wonder he's depressed. In 1982, Joyce and Lonnie Byers get a divorce. Lonnie moves to Indianapolis, and Joyce stays in Hawkins to raise their two sons, Jonathan and Will. But hey, at least Jonathan introduces Will to his favorite song, Should I Stay or Should I Go by The Clash, so that's something right? Personally, I would have gone with something off of London Calling, because Combat Rock is The Clash's worst album, but I, I'm, I'm just spitballing here. November 6th to December 12th, 1983, Season 1 and The Demogorgon. Earlier that year, Eleven participates in an experiment in the sensory deprivation tank where she's ordered to spy on a Russian agent, probably a member of the KGB. At first, the experiment is a success. He talks about the possibility of Russian spies being exposed on American soil, unaware that he is being spied on. But when the conversation ends, she sees the Demogorgon and panics. And then, everything kicks off on November November 6th. Dr. Brenner orders Eleven back into the void to make contact with the monster. Unfortunately for literally everyone, as soon as she touches the creature, a rift is formed between the dimensions, which is known as the Gate. The Demogorgon enters our dimension, and in the chaos of all the explosions and the bad times and whatnot, Eleven escapes from the lab. Sometime after that, the monster pulls Will, who's biking home after a regular night of D&D with the boys, into the other dimension, henceforth called the Upside Down. Early the next morning, Joyce realizes Will is missing and goes to the police. At first, Hopper is dismissive, thinking Will might just be playing hooky. On the other the other side of town, Eleven breaks into Benny's burgers and tries to steal some food for herself. Benny feeds her though and later calls social services. Hopper and his deputies search the woods for Will and when he finds Will's bike, Hopper begins to take the case seriously. Then this bad lady from Hawkins Lab, who the internet tells me is called Connie Frazier, shows up and kills Benny, staging it as a suicide, which honestly is one of the most heartbreaking moments of the show. He was a good dude and he just wanted to go fishing. <sighs> Rest in peace, Benny. I hope you're catching mackerel in the stars. At this point, Will's friends Mike, Lucas, and Dustin decide to start searching the woods for him, but instead they run into Eleven. They take her back to Mike's place and set her up in a pretty dope tent in the basement. The next day, a larger search party sets out to look for Will. Mike stays home with Elle and gets her hooked on Egos. She reveals that she's seen Will and that bad men are after her. When Lucas and Dustin come over after school, she reveals her telekinetic powers by slamming a door closed. While Hawkins' lab agents are snooping around the buyer's house, Jonathan is hanging missing person flyers at his school. Steve and co. laugh at him, but Nancy tries to be supportive. Jonathan then leaves school and drives to Indianapolis to see if Will's there with his dad. When Hopper finds Benny's body, he's not convinced it's a suicide, and later that night when Mr. Clark finds a scrap of fabric and a pipe that leads to Hawkins' lab, Hopper is even more suspicious. He starts to believe that Hawkins' lab is involved in Will's disappearance. That same night, Nancy and Barb go to a party at Steve's house. What? Well, well, it's more of a gathering. There's only five people. Anyway, while everyone is splashing around in Steve's pool, poor Barb cuts her hand on a beer can, and then Nancy tells Barb to go home before going upstairs with Steve to listen to Toto's Africa <coughs> in the noon. That's, uh, that's, that's what sex is, right? You just take off your clothes and listen to Africa? Sounds pretty good, actually. Sneaking around in the trees, Jonathan takes some creepy pictures of Nancy and Steve, but also snags one of a very sad Barb. After he leaves, the Demogorgon pulls Barb into the Upside Down. Hashtag justice for Barb. Back at the buyer's house, Joyce gets a call and hears Will's voice, which starts her paranormal investigation. The next morning, Nancy doesn't see Barb at school. So, see, kids, the lesson is if you have premarital sex, your friends will be pulled into another dimension and eaten by a monster from an RPG. That sounds like something that I would learn 
learn from Scream rather than Stranger Things, but whatever, I guess that's the moral. Nancy goes poking around Steve's house and finds Barb's car, but also the Demogorgon. She calls Barb's mom and finds out that Barb hasn't been home all night. Once Steve learns about Jonathan's creepy ass photo shoot, he confronts him, breaking his camera and tearing his pictures. Nancy collects the torn pieces and discovers the photo that shows Barb. Meanwhile, Hop and Co check out the Hawkins National Lab. Hopper, like the cool guy he is, totally catches the scientists in a lie. While doing some research, he and his team discover that Dr. Brenner was involved in MK Ultra and start to read about Terry Ives. Meanwhile, Joyce is investigating too. She hangs up the Christmas lights and Will begins to communicate with her through the lights, and it's going pretty well until the Demogorgon appears. Seems to always ruin stuff whenever it shows up. Eleven takes the kids on what seems to be a psychic wild goose chase to the buyer's house. The kids don't know all about the parallel dimension and are frustrated. Just then, a bunch of cop cars race by. The kids follow them and end up at the quarry, just in time to see them fish out Will's body. Mike is, uh, understandably angry and calls Elle a liar. Back at Mike's house, though, she proves that Will is still alive by making his voice come through Mike's radio. The boys decide to bring Elle to school the next day so they can use the cool radio that Mr. Clark got them to talk to Will, but not before giving Elle the makeover that sparked a million Halloween costumes. Before they can get to the radio, Mr. Clark makes them go to an assembly for Will. Standard 80s mouth breather bullies Troy and co. have the gall to laugh during it, so Mike picks a fight to stick up for his friend. Justice is served when Eleven makes Troy pee his pants in front of the whole school. When they finally get the radio, they hear Will talking to Joyce, but the radio catches fire before they can learn more. Later, they finally understand that Will is in the Upside Down. Nancy talks to the deputies about Barb's disappearance and learns that her car is missing. Anxious to do something, Nancy puts together Jonathan's torn up photo and teams up with him. Together, they enlarge the photo, revealing the Demogorgon. Even after seeing Will's body, Hopper has his doubts, so after some cop-punching detective work, he discovers that Will's body from the quarry is a fake. Joyce sees Will in the Upside Down and smashes a hole in her house to reach him, so when Lonnie shows up a little later, he thinks that she's crazy and tries to get Joyce to face reality. Hopper, meanwhile, is still on a crime-fighting spree out there, breaking into Hawkins' lab and finding the gate. You know, for a super-secret government facility, they are really susceptible to B&Es. The guards knock out Hopper, but they let him go with a warning to mind his own business, and apparently this is also the nicest super secret government facility. Oh, people keep breaking in. Ah, come on, just a slap on the wrist. Get out of here, you rapscallion. On the day of Will's funeral, the kids ask Mr. Clark how they could contact a parallel dimension, and to make a long story short, Mr. Clark tells them that they would need a huge power source. Hmm, if only there was some sort of super secret government facility nearby. Joyce finds that Lonnie is only there to try to get money from Will's death and kicks him out. Meanwhile, Hopper wakes up and realizes that his place is bugged. He finds the bug and tells Joyce that she was right all along. Dustin discovers that his compass is acting strangely and that they can use it to find the gate. The kids set out, but Eleven manipulates the compass to lead them in a circle, afraid to go back to Hawkins' lab. The kids get in a big fight and Eleven uses her powers to push Lucas. She runs off by herself and Lucas decides to go out on his own. Then Nancy and Jonathan go monster hunting. Nancy falls into the Upside Down, but Jonathan pulls her out and they go back to Nancy's house to spend the night. Unfortunately, Toto's Africa did not play that night. But Steve, who's there to apologize, sees them through the window and is very upset because apparently none of these teenagers have heard of curtains. This sounds like a peeping Tom's dream. A day later and it's time for a road trip. Joyce and Hop visit Terry Ives and her sister Becky tells them all about her time in MK Ultra and about Jane, Terry's daughter. Meanwhile, Nancy and Jonathan gear up for their next round of monster hunting with like a gun and everything. Good thing Nancy's a good shot. In town, they see what Steve and his two goons have painted on the movie theater. Steve and Jonathan get into a fight and Jonathan gets arrested. Connie Frazier, the nice guy eraser, <laughs> Sorry, I still can't believe that's her name. Visits Mr. Clark to ask about the kids. Now, who else felt a deep and visceral fear during this scene? Protect Mr. Clark, he is trying his best. Lucas goes on a cool solo adventure with his dad's nom gear. His compass leads him to Hawkins' lab where he sees a bunch of vans like the ones that have been parked around town. Mike and Dustin are out in the woods looking for Elle, but instead run into Troy the bully and his lackeys. Troy makes Mike jump into the quarry, but Eleven shows up, levitates Mike to safety, and breaks Troy's arm. As they get back to town, Lucas warns them that the bad men are coming. Time for the 80s bike chase scene. The kids hide out at the junkyard until Hopper contacts them and tells them that he can help. They all meet up at the buyer's house and Eleven tells them that she can find Will with a sensory deprivation tank. The kids call Mr. Clark and find out just how much salt they're gonna need to make one. And so the whole gang meets up at the middle school to make that sensory deprivation tank. In the Upside Down, Eleven first locates Barb's body and then finds Will in Castle Byers. He's still alive. Afterwards, everyone splits up with Joyce and Hop heading back to the gate to try to get Will back. I mean, I know it's the 80s, but you know, there is a monster out there is splitting up really the 
the best idea? No, of course it isn't. Joyce and Hopper break into the lab and get caught, yet again. Nancy and Jonathan abandon the kids to go set a trap for the monster at the buyer's house. And Steve, who realizes he's been a real asshat, shows up to apologize to Jonathan just in time for the Demogorgon to show up. Back at the school, Mike and Eleven sneak in a smooch before all hell breaks loose. Agents show up to get her, but so does the Demogorgon. Eleven straight up kills the agents, destroys the Demogorgon, and also disappears, like she literally dematerializes in front of everyone. Not to worry, though, she's just in the upside down. Okay, maybe be a little worried. At the gate, Joyce and Hopper suit up like they're going on a field trip to Chernobyl. They enter the upside down, find Will, and bring him back to our world. They rush Will to the hospital, where he later wakes up and is greeted by his friends. Eleven makes her way back from the upside down the next day, and when she goes to Mike's house, she sees agents there and realizes that she'll put him in danger if she returns. Hopper goes off with some government agents who are there for unknown, but probably nefarious purposes. Mike starts trying to contact Eleven via radio and keeps it up for 352 days. That's dedication. Meanwhile, Eleven's been surviving in the woods, living off of squirrels. She even knocks out a hunter and takes his coat for the winter. A few weeks later, and Mike, Will, Dustin, and Lucas are back to playing D&D in Mike's basement. Nancy and Steve are still together, and they give Jonathan a new camera for Christmas when he comes to pick up Will. When they get home, Will coughs up a slug thing and sees the upside down briefly in the bathroom. That same night, Hopper ghosts from the police Christmas party to leave some egos for Eleven in the woods. Eleven finds them, and the next day, she sees that it's Hopper leaving them for her. And then they go to his grandfather's cabin and begin living there like a weird, paranoid, but surprisingly wholesome family. So, that wraps up the events of Season 1, but before we head into Season 2, there's a few details we have to cover to set the whole thing up. Between December of 1983 and October of 1984, Sam Owens replaces Brenner as the director of Hawkins' lab. After the whole upside-down ordeal, Will starts going to the lab to be monitored and studied, and a second gate to the upside-down forms underneath the lab and tunnels from underneath Hawkins, all while they're trying to burn the original gate closed in the lab. Also, Joyce begins dating local nerd Bob Newby. How weird do you think it would have been for Sean Astin to be on a show that's an homage to his best-known movie, The Goonies? What, is that not his best-known movie? Well, what is? Oh, yep, 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 okay, you're right. And at some point, Billy and Max move to Hawkins from California, which they aren't super hype about. Season 2 and the Mind Flare, October 29th to December 15th, 1984. Okay, so Season 2 finally starts in Pittsburgh. Remember Kali, Eleven's psychic roommate from Hawkins' lab? Okay, well she and a sh**ier version of the Suicide Squad are being chased by the cops and Kali uses her mind powers to make the cops think that she blew up a tunnel. Back in Hawkins, the boys go to the new palace arcade to play Dragon's Lair. Dustin finds that many of his high scores have been beaten by a mysterious gamer called Mad Max. Will sees the Upside Down again and Mike finds him in the parking lot acting strange. The next day is Max and Billy's first day at Hawkins Middle and High. And, you know, the boys find out that Mad Max's real identity is Max. Will goes to the Hawkins lab for a checkup, and Dr. Owens tells Joyce and Hopper that things are going to be harder for him around the anniversary of his disappearance. Also, there's Murray Bauman, the journalist? Private investigator? Local loon? Whatever he is, he's looking into the mystery of what happened last year. Hopper investigates the spooky dying pumpkin mystery, but uh, doesn't think too much of it. Nancy and Steve have dinner with Barb's parents. Turns out they're selling their house to pay Murray Bauman to investigate Barb's disappearance. Of course, Nancy feels very guilty about it. Mike is still trying to contact Eleven, but she's stuck in the cabin, hoping to go out for Halloween, but Hopper says going outside would be stupid, even in costume, and promises to bring her candy tomorrow night. Will has another vision and sees the new monster, the Mind Flayer, outside his house. He later draws a picture of it. The boys dress as the Ghostbusters at school for Halloween, but uh, no one else dresses up. So they just look cool all on their own. Dustin and Lucas ask Max to go trick-or-treating with them, and uh, it goes about as well as you would expect. After school, Billy picks up Max and notices that she seems to like their new town, and that sets Billy off. And when he sees Mike, Dustin, and Lucas on the road, uh, he tries to run them over. Hopper's still having a pumpkin adventure and learns that the crops are dying at other farms too. He investigates all day, marking all of the trees that the rot has spread to. The kids go trick-or-treating, taking Bob's video camera with them. Max shows up, and while Dustin and Lucas are thrilled, Mike is not. Will sees the Mind Flare again, and Mike finds him having an episode. Then Mike takes Will back to his basement, where they proceed to talk about their shared trauma. And that is what friendship is made of. In the realm of teenagers, Steve and Nancy go to a cool party, with more than five people this time, where Steve gets heckled by Billy, the keg stand king. And then Jonathan shows up and mistakes an obvious Susie Sue costume for Kiss, because Jonathan is secretly a poser, I guess. Steve and Nancy get in a very high school fight, and Jonathan Jonathan takes her home after she gets drunk. Eleven's Halloween is a lot quieter. She's still stuck in the cabin, getting impatient waiting for Hopper to get home. So she tries to contact Mike. When he finally gets home late, Hopper and Elle have a heated argument. Dustin gets home from trick-or-treating and finds a strange little polywog creature in his trash. He takes it inside and feeds it a Three Musketeers bar and names it D'Artagnan. Dart, for short. The next day, Hopper traces Pumpkin Death back to the Hawkins lab. <gasps> 
What a shock! He gives Dr. Owens a real dressing down, and Owens decides to help investigate the pumpkin deaths. Billy gets all up in Steve's business and basketball practice, and then uh, Steve and Nancy have another argument. It's, uh, it's a bad day for Steve. Dustin brings Dart to school to impress Max and Mr. Clark, which may not have been the best idea, because Dart escapes and the kids spend all afternoon looking for him, although they still don't explain what's going on to Max. Bob tells Joyce he saw kids on the videotape from last night picking on Will, but when Joyce watches the tape, she sees the outline of the mind flare and recognizes it from Will's picture. Meanwhile, Eleven, who's still angry at Hopper, decides to leave the cabin to go see Mike. She happens to see Mike and Max together on her way, and she gets jealous, and it gets the best of her, and she makes Max fall off her skateboard, which is probably a decent outcome. We already know that Eleven is capable of way worse. Nancy and Jonathan start their plan to get hashtag justice for Barb rolling by calling her parents, knowing that the goons at Hawkins' lab are going to be listening. While looking for Dart, Will sees the Upside Down again, and after a motivational talk with poor, well-meaning Bob, Will tries to confront the Mind Flayer, only to have it possess his body. That's a, that's a big whoops! Joyce finds him at school, unable to move, and takes him home, convinced something is happening again. Dustin finds Dart and brings him home, but doesn't tell the others who think that Dart is a threat. Eleven gets back to the cabin and has a HUGE fight with Hopper when he takes away her TV as punishment for leaving the house. She even uses her powers on him! Nancy and Jonathan are being stalked by Hawkins Lab agents disguised as 80s suburbanites. Well, I mean, it is the 80s, so I guess they're just suburbanites at that point. They're taken to Hawkins Lab, and Owens tells them to not look into Barb's death anymore. The lab henchmen don't search their bags at all, though, and Nancy records the whole thing. Did they learn nothing from all of the other times people broke into the lab last year? It's like they want to get caught! At school, Steve finds out that Nancy and Jonathan are both skipping and has a weird shower scene with Billy. Billy's got a real fixation with Steve. Will starts making drawings to explain the Mind Flayer to Joyce and Hopper, and they connect the drawings to make a weird kind of map. Mike, realizing Will isn't at school, goes to his house to make sure he's okay, only to be sucked into the insanity. Hopper seems to figure out what the drawings are of, and goes off to investigate, without explaining to anyone else or telling them where he's going. He only says that they're vines, which is super not helpful. He climbs down the nightmare hole, and then he immediately gets spored in the face. Back in the cabin, Eleven finds a box with information about Hawkins' lab, including a final about her mother, Terry. She tries to contact Terry in the void, and Terry seems to see her. Dustin gets home and finds that Dart has eaten his cat, at which point he finally figures out that Dart is a, is a bad. Hey guys, don't let it get to this point. Know the warning signs that the strange creature in your trash is actually a monster from another dimension. Sign one, it doesn't look like any known species. Sign two, you live in a town that's prone to monsters and weird things. And three, it likes three musketeers. Once the lab guys let them go, Jonathan and Nancy check into a hotel for some reason. They don't put on Toto's Africa, so I'm not really sure why they don't just go home. One day later, Will tells Joyce and Mike that he saw Hopper having some kind of trouble within the tunnels. Man, if only Hopper had told them what he was doing! Bob Newby shows up and thinks they're having some sort of very intense orienteering adventure and figures out what the map is showing. It's the town of Hawkins. He uses his cool nerd skills to locate Hopper, and they all rush out to the pumpkin patch to try to find him. At the arcade, Lucas privately tells Max about what happened last year. Eleven, the Upside Down, the Demogorgon, the whole thing, and of course, Max doesn't believe him. Dustin gears up and traps Dart in his cellar, but when he radios the gang, uh, they're all busy. So he gets help from Steve Harrington, Monster Slayer and Hair Icon. Unfortunately, by the time Steve gets to Dustin's place, Dart has already burrowed through the cellar wall and escaped. Back in the lab, the scientists test the soil sample and find out that the evil vines hate fire, and it all reacts at once with some sort of hive mind. Eleven hitchhikes to her mom's house and sees Terry. After suffering trauma at the hands of Hawkins' lab, Terry is only able to say a small selection of words. But Eleven and Terry connect in the void, and Eleven sees what happened to her back in 1974, including getting her first glimpse of Kali. With the information she needed in hand, Eleven steals some money and goes off to find her sister, Kali. Bob, Joyce, Mike, and Will find the hole to the upside down tunnels and save Hopper. As they're pulling him out, the lab techs show up in full hazmat gear and try to burn all the gross vines, but as soon as the fire starts, Will starts convulsing and is rushed to the lab. Still determined, Nancy and Jonathan drive out to meet with Bauman. They correct his messed up timeline and tell him what really happened last year. They all agree to send Nancy's recording to newspapers as evidence, and they celebrate with some vodka. And of course, Nancy and Jonathan finally hook up. It's another bad day for Steve. Eleven locates Kali in Chicago with a knockoff Doom Patrol. They show each other their lab tattoos, and Kali recognizes. Her. Later that night, Will wakes up in the lab, but has started to lose his memory, forgetting Dr. Owens, Bob, and Hopper. By that next morning, Dr. Owens tells Joyce and Hopper that Will is connected to the hive mind via the virus that infected him when the Mind Flayer touched him. Nancy and Jonathan have a very awkward breakfast with Bauman before heading back to the buyer's house. There they find Will's drawings and an empty case for Polaroid film. Polaroid is too mainstream for Jonathan, so they know that someone else was in the house. They head back for the Hawkins lab. Dustin and Steve go out to try to catch Dart, at which point Steve tells Dustin his hairspray secrets. It's very important 
bonding moment for everyone's favorite dad, Steve, and it's also a very important plot moment, so it's a good thing I mentioned it. Back in Chicago, Kali helps Eleven train her powers. Using the Void, Eleven locates one of the old workers from Hawkins' lab who's responsible for her mother's shock treatment. Eleven gets another makeover, but this one did not inspire nearly as many Halloween costumes. Eh, can't win them all. Lucas convinces Max that he can prove that everything he said yesterday is true. They meet up with Justin and Steve to capture Dart, who's grown into a full-blown demodog. They all end up at the junkyard again, and a whole bunch of other demodogs show up and attack them. At this point, Max finally believes Lucas. I mean, they nearly got eaten. Thankfully, the Mind Flayer calls the demodog off. But the Mind Flayer wasn't just showing them mercy. After using Will to get the lab guys into the tunnels, it sicks all the demodogs on them. From there, the demodogs attack the lab. Mike realizes that the Mind Flayer has completely possessed Will, so he tells Joyce to drug him so they can escape to a safe location. Hopper, Joyce, Will, Mike, Bob, and Dr. Owens hide in the surveillance room, but the lab loses power for reasons. Eleven and the Super Friends go to confront the retired Hawkins lab employee, Ray Carroll. When they get to Ray's house, Kali tries to convince Eleven to kill him for what he did to her mother, but Ray's got kids, so Eleven feels bad about getting revenge. She even stops Kali from killing him, which Kali's not cool with. Max and Billy's parents come home to find Billy getting ready for a date, with Max nowhere to be found. Billy's dad forces him to cancel the date and go find Max. So, you know, Billy... Uh, Billy mad. The rest of the gang meets up with Jonathan and Nancy at the gates of the lab and realize that the others are trapped inside. Back in Chicago, the Secret Six are ambushed by the cops. They manage to escape, but Eleven decides to go back to Hawkins to help Mike and Hopper. In the control room, Bob's cool nerd skills mean he has to be the one to go down to the basement and reset the breakers and restore power to the lab. And that is why I never learned to code, and not because I'm super lazy. Once Bob clears a path, everyone escapes except Dr. Owens, who remains in the control room, and Bob gets so close to making it, but he gets mauled by a demodog. Can we pour one out for Bob Newby? Gone too soon. Everyone else heads back to the buyer's house and comes up with a plan. They hide their location from the Will Flare by disguising the buyer's shed and questioning him. While the real Will can't talk to them directly, he taps out a message in Morse code and tells them to close gate. But just then, the phone rings and the Will Flare figures out where they are. Everyone prepares for an all-out demodog attack. But before the dogs can wreck their shit, Eleven shows up and wrecks them first. After a tearful reunion, it's decided that Eleven will close the gate and Hopper will go with her. Jonathan, Nancy, and Joyce take a sedated Will to Hopper's cabin so they can force the Mind Flayer out of him. Meanwhile, Bill tries to pick up Nancy's mom. Way to go, Karen. Dustin, Mike, Lucas, and Max decide to go to the tunnels under the pumpkin patch and set them on fire to draw the demodogs away from the lab. But before they can, Billy shows up to take Max home. They have a big, gnarly fight and Billy pretty much kicks Steve's ass. Okay, I'm starting to think that Steve doesn't just have bad days. It just sucks to be him. Max finally sedates Billy, and they steal his car and head off to the tunnels with an unconscious Steve in the back seat. In Hopper's cabin, Joyce, Jonathan, and Nancy force the Mind Flare from Will, just full exorcist style. Back in the tunnels, Team Steve set fire to the vines and managed to draw the demodog's attention. And who comes to their rescue but Dart? I guess he wasn't all bad. In the lab, Eleven basically goes full Super Saiyan. She uses Kali's training, unleashes her anger, and finally closes the gate. Hopefully for good this time. But, you know, there is a season three. So. At some point over the next few weeks, Bauman's evidence is released and Hawkins' lab closes in the following media frenzy. Barb finally gets her funeral and Bauman goes on to investigate chemtrails or something. Hopper gets a birth certificate from Dr. Owens and now Eleven is officially Jane Hopper. And finally, the moment we've all been waiting for, the snowball dance. Mike and Eleven dance together, Max and Lucas dance together, Will dances with some random girl, and Dustin dances with Nancy. Isn't that sweet? Oh wait, not so fast, because the Mind Flayer is still over Hawkins Middle School in the Upside Down. All right, now we're all caught up for season three of Stranger Things. Any predictions? After Benny, Barb, Brenner, and Bob, I'm wondering what other B character is gonna get killed off this season, and I'm really hoping it's Billy. I've been Jacob with Cinematica, and thanks for watching.